Elfin Lead has one of the most chilling openings of any anime I've ever observed. The song Lilium is an absolutely haunting elegy that plays over some rather breathtaking imagery in which the characters are arranged to resemble early 20th century art. The lyrics are in Latin and upon translation tells that those who endure temptation are to be blessed, while those who would dare to undo one's purity out of malice are exposed to judgment that they deserve. This opening sat with me to prepare for a truly excellent horror anime that I did not get. Elfin Lead is to this day one of the most disappointing anime I've ever watched cover to cover, and there's a lot to harp on. I could talk about the animation and how it looks like the peak of awkward early 2000s transition visuals. I could talk about how the plot absolutely hinders on the most craven of convolutions, and I could talk about the bizarre incest subplot going on. But what stands out to me is the persistent feeling that this didn't have to go wrong. Elfin Lee tells the story of Lucy, a character that I think of a lot because she had every opportunity to be an absolutely grand villain. Lucy was tormented for years because she's a Diclonius, an instance of advanced human evolution with horns on her head that grant her immense powers. Those who would torture Lucy out of their prejudice or try to exploit her gifts meet brutal demises, and this is more or less the conceit of the series. And for all intents and purposes, Lucy should work. Her desire to lash out at those who abuse her is the groundwork that fuels similar villains for years, from comic book icons like Magneto to figures as old as storytelling itself like the Greek figure Medea. Lucy's overall conceit invokes these types of vengeful Templars, and yet, she doesn't bring out the same fear or reverence they do. Despite everything that doesn't work about Elfin Lead, maybe it would be worthwhile if Lucy clicked, so why doesn't she? The crux of why that is becomes very clear when I reveal that I only said 50% of Lucy's premise. Near the show's opening, Lucy suffers a brain injury that more or less gives her a split dissociative personality, swapping between the murderous Lucy and the infantile, helpless Niu. It's in this subplot that Lucy as Niu reunites with an estranged love in Coda, and equally so, we're treated to the downright gratuitous fan service wrought through half of the series, as the less aware and more passive Niu exposes herself to hilariously sexualizing hijinks out of her control. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with some eye candy, but the infantilization of the character in question, combined with the just overall bizarre writing choices, make the scenes nothing short of baffling, especially when this character is meant to be taken extremely seriously as a misanthropic, mass-murdering supervillain. That said, many would argue that for Lucy to experience kindness, even if in a split personality to keep her from immediately wanting to kill anyone, is necessary for her growth, and the eventual conclusion she reaches at the end of the series that perhaps mankind is worth some modicum of fate. But the choice to give Lucy her brain trauma and alternate personality are still far more detrimental than anything else to the story, and I feel the reason that is the case can be extended to why Lucy doesn't work as a villain, and why Elfin Lee doesn't really work as a piece of horror. Lucy's bloodlust back to back with her simple-minded and often objectified antics harkens back to the femme fatale, a trope I'm sure you're all familiar with. One who uses their amorous wiles to lull opposition into a false sense of security before striking. It's not hard to see why this archetype has persisted, the sensual appeal still isn't lost, but it serves as sort of an ironic comeuppance to those who would objectify someone, and empowers those who are perhaps similarly objectified in real life. Lucy's mentality, as stated in the lyrics of Lilium, ties to this as well, and are followed up on in the series, as many of her victims are those who would take advantage of her power and or her body. Lucy eschews from the traditional trope somewhat by placing herself opposite a maternal figure as opposed to a romantic or sensual one, but this variation isn't unheard of or unwelcome on its own. However, the appeal of a femme fatale character comes from an explicit autonomy to reclaim power with and the two ingredients of this formula are split up along with Lucy's psyche. A femme fatale is rarely of the disposition to fight or hold their own conventionally, which is why they rely on underhanded tactics, and Lucy contradicts this principle because she's insanely powerful, capable of killing most with little more than a mere thought, meaning there's no point where she uses her own autonomy to lull someone into lowering their guard. 
people seem to do so around her is simply because they're playing the role of a victim to such a Black Widow sort. But it doesn't add up and just comes off as nonsensical when these characters have every reason to fear someone as strong as Lucy. As a result of this clumsy mishandling of tropes, the tension from any of Lucy's kills is sapped dry. And there's no anticipation because it's obvious she's capable and driven to slaughter her victims and easily. And because it comes so easily, it's not empowering to anyone who could relate to Lucy because such a person with so much power doesn't exist. The femme fatale is a power fantasy for those who tire of being objectified and a cautionary tale of the human and common sin of objectification, whereas to try to take advantage of Lucy is unfathomably stupid on the spot, and to see her kill is nothing short of an inevitable outcome. And yet, I'd argue Lucy's level of power doesn't even need to be a factor in this conversation, as she could still be interesting and scary if she relied on anything besides her brute strength as a Diclonius. Lucy is very one-dimensional in her killer persona, she has very little on her mind and very few skills to use besides killing in the most brutal fashion she can think of. Just because she's absurdly strong doesn't mean the matter needs to be easy for her. Some really strong writing can corner her in a way that allows for physical violence to not always be a first option, and I feel I can demonstrate that using another villain one I'm extremely fond of and terrified by, and who is, for good measure, just as absurdly powerful if not more so than Lucy, Homelander from The Boys. Within his series, Homelander is the world's most famous superhero, but only in occupation as behind closed doors he's an utterly narcissistic and violent sociopath. Homelander uses his winning smile and career to draw millions of adoring fans, and those are crowds that hide his hateful, selfish, and sinister heart. Take this scene where he's auditioning new members of his superhero team, and he meets Blindspot, a hero who demonstrates insane acrobatic skills using his super hearing to compensate for his lack of eyesight. And Homelander seems incredibly impressed before his true colors erupt back to the surface and he assaults Blindspot, humiliating the superhero hopeful and spitting on the idea of a blind man on his team. And as heinous as Homelander's prejudice and scary his overall power is, what sold this scene as so chilling was how convincingly Homelander feigned interest before he, at the drop of a hat, lashed out, reinforcing that no matter how pleased Homelander appears before anyone, his opposition is always seconds away from pain and misery. I bring this up because such a precedent never exists with Lucy. To kill is the only thing on this woman's mind, and she makes no attempt to hide it. And there's a lot more room for tension and build-up in horror media when there is that wiggle room. But because Lucy's vectors can tear anyone she wants to ribbons in a matter of effortless moments, she feels no need to blend in or put up a front and that makes some degree of sense practically. But recall the scene I described with Homelander and how much it spoke to him. How he has something to save face for, and it makes him such an enthralling bad guy, contrary to Lucy. And the thing is, Lucy just about grasps at this principle through her Niyu personality. By having Lucy shift to Niyu and cozy into her found family with Koda, the character seems to ride on the coattails of the nuance I'm aiming for except it is in no way begotten by Lucy's autonomy. Lucy's brain injury is just a convoluted plot device to keep someone around her long enough without getting killed by her, so she can have her arc and realize humans aren't all that bad. And so this isn't a promiscuous character weaponizing her own sexuality or playing up an emotional appeal to save face. It's a bizarre, conditional universe playing Lucy to its whims so it can have its cake of a deadly, sexy character and eat it too by removing all of her awareness and self ward Why not have Lucy aware of what she's doing? What if she was aware she'd need protection and a roof over her head, and feigned her innocence to the first group of people kind enough to welcome her? Imagine the tension of housing someone you don't even know is a killer, and a catharsis that it's this fully conscientious kindness that causes Lucy to turn over a new leaf in the series' climax. Doesn't that sound not only a lot smoother and easier to track, 
but more enforcing of Lucy's character. I look at Lucy and I see the tragic, vengeful figures I've always loved in media and fiction, and yet I look at Elfin Lead as a whole, and I see every harmful stigmatic stereotype that adds to a series that bends the logic of its universe and characters to tropes that cater to a niche. I call Elfin Lead the embodiment of what someone who doesn't watch anime thinks all anime is. Overviolent, gratuitously sexualized, truly bizarre, truly nonsensical series. And it has all the nuance and quality of this paper thin ideal. There is a timeline alternate of ours where Lucy is an icon of J horror, an empowering and terrifying villain who's still discussed to this day. But now she remains a relic of the turn of the century's fascination with pushing the envelope an envelope forever sealed where she and Elfin lead will hopefully and deservingly be long, never to be opened again.